Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to our fifth session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir, which is the 35th chapter of the Quran. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, verse number eight and we'll uh, pick up our conversation uh, with this verse. So if you have a copy of the Mus'haf or if you just like to follow along as we read on the screen, uh, you can do that. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Verse number eight. أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ فَلَا تَذْهَبْ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتٍ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ And of and what of one, the evil of whose deeds has been made attractive, attractive to him such that he thinks it beautiful. Truly God leads astray whomsoever he will and guides whomsoever he will. So let not your soul be expended in regrets over them. Truly God knows that which they do. In the previous verse, we spoke about shaitan. We spoke about Satan being an open enemy to the human being. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares one of the strategies of shaitan, whereby he beautifies something that is inherently evil, meaning that the person begins to see things in a perverted way. Now, <clears throat> a heart, this qalb, in its default condition when the heart is still upon the fitrah it has this rudimentary ability to distinguish between right and wrong and emphasis here is on rudimentary ability we are all born with some sense of what is good and what is evil what is right and what is wrong now in order for this this primordial goodness to develop, this is where we need the assistance of revelation. Now, the fitra can help you distinguish right and wrong in some cases, but not every situation, not in every situation, it's not that obvious. And this is why the combination of fitra and revelation gives the human being a much clearer criterion for good and evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah, in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 29, He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن تَتَّقُوا اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا O you who have believed, if you are conscious of God, and of course, to be conscious of God means that you have to obey what he has commanded, and you have to refrain from what he has forbidden. And this is something that can only be outlined by the Sharia. If you follow, if you obey God, if you are conscious of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. Meaning that this, this ability that you have, the fitra becomes more sophisticated because, because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants this ability to the soul, that it has a, a more keen sense of what is good and what is evil. Now, a heart, now, so this is for a heart that is pure, for a heart that is healthy, for a heart that is obedient to God. It begins to grow and mature. And through this divine assistance, it is it, it can clearly distinguish between good and evil, and it's, it's attracted to that which is good. Now, what happens is that a heart which is tainted by sin, by ma'asiyah, a heart, a heart which has not been tainted by, by sin is able to perceive the inherent ugliness of sin. This is a qalb that is salim, 
that is pure, that is sound. However, if someone treads the path of disobedience, if a person defies God, if a person persistently sins, the heart becomes sick. The heart experiences a type of ailment. And when the heart becomes sick, and this is why sinning is so dangerous, because it infects the heart. It causes the heart to become diseased. And when we say heart, we're talking about, you know, the center of decision making, you know, the center of the center of, of decision making and emotion. When a person persists in sin, the heart becomes sick. And when the heart becomes ill, it loses its ability to function properly. So we said that the, the fitra in its natural state, the heart, before it is tarnished, it has this ability to distinguish between good and evil, between right and wrong. But if, if a person sins, the heart becomes sick and it loses this ability. And therefore, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's similar to our physiology. You know, for example, if when your eyes are healthy, you can see, you can see clearly, you can distinguish objects. But if you have an eye infection, if there is an ailment in your eye, you know, things are not clear anymore. Why? Because of the, the presence of that condition, because of that disease, because of that ailment. So such people who have these hearts that are corrupted, they see what is ugly as beautiful. So what is inherently ugly to them, it's attractive because the, the heart is not functioning properly. The heart is sick. And they also perceive what is beautiful as ugly. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute beauty, but they... They're, they, they're, they're repelled. They see anything that is related to God to be something that is unattractive. So when the heart is diseased, it loses this ability. It doesn't function properly and it's not able to distinguish good from evil. And not only that, it, 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 it gets it mixed up. It starts to perceive that which is beautiful as ugly and that which is ugly as Beautiful. Now, when the heart is diseased, when the heart is saqim, when, when, when it is diseased, it becomes vulnerable to satanic insinuations. It's almost, it's like a, a, an animal that is wounded and it's surrounded by a, uh, a predator. Shaitan exploits you now that you've weakened this ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And this is where you see, for example, in Surah An-Naml, verse 24, and Allah speaks about uh, how Shaitan does this. He says, the Quran says, so this is uh, with uh, in relation to the story of, of Sulaiman with the, the Hoopi bird who who was not uh, present in the assembly uh, of Suleiman. When it returns, Suleiman notices that the Hoopi bird is absent because of course they were, they were, they were, it was kind of essentially, you know, some type of ceremony where his soldiers were marching, there were jinn and the birds were flying. And then Suleiman sees that there, there's a beam of light shining down on him. He looks up and he sees that the Hoopi bird is missing. In any case, when the bird returns, he asks the bird where you were, what was the reason for your absence, and he says that I went to a land, and I there was a woman ruling that uh, that region. The bird says I found her and her people prostrating to the sun instead of Allah, instead of God. And Satan has made their deeds pleasing to them, meaning that he suggests justifications for these actions. 
فصدهم عن السبيل فهم لا يهتدون and he averted them from his way so they are not guided so you know in, in psychology I've, I've written here that there's a, a concept and this is something that shaitan you know participates in through his suggestions there is a concept in psychology known as moral justification and this basically refers to the process where when someone is doing something that is morally questionable they attempt to make it seem right so for example with the case of bilqis you know the queen of sheba and her people you know i can imagine that their justification for prostrating to the sun would be would be the following and this is something that shaitan would would uh, whisper into their hearts that you know look at the celestial body it's so elevated in the heavens so it's obviously superior to us <clears throat> we benefit from the sun the sun provides warmth it it allows for uh, for vegetation to grow and so on and so forth so without the sun we wouldn't exist life would not be able to sustain itself and therefore we are expressing our gratitude to this celestial body so you see shaitan is able to make our deeds our misdeeds in fact pleasing and and fair to us in our eyes now from an islamic perspective we believe that this process of moral justification is facilitated by shaitan so this is not just the human being independently coming to these conclusions we believe that you know you know الناس, that shaitan plays a role in this that sometimes we have thoughts that that we think originate from us but they actually originate from him but we don't we don't recognize that and we don't uh, you know we're not able to trace that and then the the ayah continues فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ so if we go back to the beginning of the verse أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوَ عَمَلِهِ فَرَأَوْهُ حَسَنًا and what of one the evil of whose deeds has been made attractive to him such that he thinks it beautiful so this is a reference to someone <clears throat> whose heart has become corrupted because the heart the qalb in its natural state does have the ability to distinguish between right and wrong this is the fitra but when the heart is corrupted we lose this ability to distinguish between right and wrong and if someone continues to sin and rebel the heart becomes so corrupted that what is evil seems good and what is good seems evil so this shows you how how much the spiritual disease in the heart has progressed and then allah says truly god leads astray whomsoever he will and guides whomsoever he will now this verse you know unfortunately it's been cited by some sects within islam to support the ideology of fatalism and fatalism is essentially predestination that no matter what i do you know i can go to the mosque i can read every book about islam but it's not going to change the outcome because allah has determined that i am an i am a disbeliever or Allah has determined that I'm a believer. So some have understood this verse to mean that it's not in our hands. God guides whoever he chooses and he misguides whomsoever he chooses. And therefore, Allah has chosen who is going to believe and he has chosen he has selected whom whomsoever will uh, will reject. Now how do we reconcile this and and there are many verses that echo this same message that god guides people and god misguides so how can we reconcile this ayah with allah's justice you know is this is this an arbitrary process does does allah just say you know i like the, i like the way this person looks and therefore i'm going to guide him is there is it just arbitrary is it random so how do we reconcile these verses with Allah's adala number 1 al-adl al-ilahi and number 2 
How do we reconcile it with the notion of free will? Because we believe that human beings, to a certain extent, have free will. Now, to answer this question, to understand the message of this ayah, we have to understand the nature of the heart. And when we say heart, obviously we're not talking about the physical heart. We're talking about the qal, which is the center of decision-making, the center of emotion, and so on and so forth. Now, the heart is a very delicate creation. You know, the word qal comes from the verb, which means to change, because the heart is always changing. You know, this is why when you look at the munajat of Imam Zainul Abidin, you'll find that his whispered prayers, there are 15 of them, and they, they refer to different states of the heart. You know, Munajatu Shakirin, the whispered prayer of, of the whispered prayers of the thankful. You know, sometimes the heart feels gratitude, sometimes the heart feels fear, sometimes the heart feels anxiety, sometimes the heart longs for Allah, sometimes the heart, you know, is is withdraws from God. The heart is a very delicate creature. You know, we, we can't, oftentimes we can't control who we like and we can't control who we dislike. So the qalb is a very, very delicate creation of Allah. It quickly turns towards something and it quickly turns away from things. And this is why we have a famous hadith that's mentioned in Sunni and uh, Shia hadith literature. Sunni and Shia hadith sources, and there are different iterations of the hadith, but the, the, the main message of the hadith is that verily the hearts, the hearts of people, are between the two fingers of the beneficent. Now, Allah, what does it mean? Now, of course, this is this is metaphorical because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have fingers. You know, Laysa kemithli shay. If Allah had fingers, then it would mean that He's similar to the, the millions and millions of the billions of creatures who have fingers. But there's nothing like him. Allah is not a physical being. So this is metaphorical. Now, what this means is that God turns hearts toward him or he turns hearts away from him. This is why the expression two fingers. Allah turns hearts towards him or he turn heart, turns hearts away from him. And this, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interacts with our hearts depends our eagerness to reach him. Depends on our eagerness to know him and attain nearness to him. And it's also related to the way that we conduct ourselves. If Allah loves what we do, if we perform righteous deeds, if we're decent human beings, if we have a thirst for the truth, Allah turns our hearts towards him. Like the example of Salman al-Farisi. He was a morally upright person who was thirsty for the truth. Allah oriented his heart towards him. And if Allah hates what you do, if you're an evil person, a corrupt person, a hateful person, an oppressive person, if Allah hates what you do, he turns, if he hates what we do, he turns our hearts away from him. He turns our hearts away from him. Because you cannot be evil and attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like water and oil, they don't mix. So we can control our actions, but we can't control our hearts. You decide what you want to believe. You decide what you want to do. And after you make those decisions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interacts with your heart in a way that is based on the way that you're conducting yourself. And the beauty of Allah, the beauty of the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with us is that Allah gives us what we want. 
and this applies to all people. There's a beautiful ayah in the Quran in Surah, uh, Surah Al Isra, verses 18 and 19. This verse beautifully summarizes, you know, this idea of God turning hearts towards Him or turning hearts away from Him. Allah says, Man kana yuridu ajjalna lahu fiha ma nasha'u liman nurid. Whoever should desire the immediate, if you desire this material world, we hasten for him from it what we will to whom we intend. Then we have made for him hell, which he will enter, burn, censored, and banished. Allah says, if, if your heart wants dunya, I'll turn it away from me. You can have it, but you have to suffer the consequence because hell is the physical manifestation of being separated from God. You want to choose that path? That's up to you. So if the heart wants dunya, if it just wants the material world, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns it away from him. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا But whoever desires the hereafter and exerts the effort due to it while he is a believer, it is those whose effort is ever appreciated by God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we go back to the verse that God, Allah guides whomsoever He wills, Allah guides those who wish to be guided. And Allah misguides, meaning He leaves them to their own devices. He misguides, He allows people to be misguided if they want to be misguided. If they don't, if they're not interested, if they have no desire to reach Him, to draw closer to Him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He essentially gives us what we want. And He guides us if we if we desire the truth. And he leaves us to our own if, if, if we wish to turn away. فَلَا تَذْهَبْ نَفْسُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتٍ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ So let not your soul, Allah is now addressing the Prophet, so, not, so let not your soul be expended in regrets over them. Truly God knows that which they do. This verse, of course, highlights the compassion and the care that the Prophet ﷺ felt for even the disbelievers, even those who rejected him. The Prophet felt great distress when he witnessed their stubbornness and their refusal to submit to the truth. It was hasra. You know, the Prophet felt this anguish and this distress in his heart. But Allah says to the Prophet that Inna Allah, bima Allah knows what they do. And Allah says, I interact with them based on the way that they conduct themselves. I turn hearts towards me if they're good, if they desire me. But if they don't desire me, I'm not going to force someone to be close to me. Allah is not going to force you to have a relationship with him. Allah says you're free. If you, if you don't want me in your life, that's your decision. But you have to live with the consequences. But if you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be at the, at the center of your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn your heart to Him. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, because he enjoyed, he experienced the pleasure of divine proximity, he wanted this for everybody, you know. This is why he's rahmatan lil alameen. You know, when you have something good and you're a kind, decent person, you want to share that goodness with everybody. The Prophet ﷺ enjoys the highest goodness, the highest pleasure, which is al qurbul ilahi, which is closeness to Allah. There is nothing, there is no, no, there is no joy that is more rapturous than the joy of nearness to God. And the Prophet wants everyone to experience this. And therefore he feels 
great distress when people cling to this lower existence, when they insist on functioning just as as lower beasts whose only concern is food and drink and material enjoyments. But this is not what it means to be alive. You are operating at a very minimal level of existence. So Allah says to the Prophet, Indeed, O Muhammad, you, you do not guide whom you like. The Prophet wishes to guide everybody, especially you know, his people, you know, the Meccans, Quraysh, his own tribe. Allah guides whom he wills, and Allah wills to guide those who wish to be guided. And he knows those who are, who are rightly guided, who wish to be guided, who seek guidance. In another verse, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ There has certainly come to you, to the, the Arabs, a messenger from among yourselves. Grievous to him is what you suffer. The Prophet feels great pain when he sees people suffer, especially when they suffer spiritually. You know, physical suffering, it has, it doesn't last forever, but the, the suffering of the soul that he sees around him uh, is very painful for him to witness. Harisun alaykum. He is very protective of you. He's very concerned over you. This is how the, the Prophet is haris over everybody because the Prophet ﷺ is, you know, the spiritual father of all human beings, all people. So this is this, and, and you see even in the Prophet, you see that there is this universal love that he has, which is similar to the attribute of Allah, ar rahmaniyyah And then you have the special love and care that he shows mu'mineen. Bil mu'mineen ar-ra'ufur rahim. And to the believers, he's exceptionally kind and merciful. Now, the next ayah. وَاللَّهُ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ الرِّيَاحَ فَتُثِيرُ سَحَابًا فَسُقْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ بَلَدٍ مَيِّتٍ فَأَحْيَيْنَا بِهِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا كَذَلِكَ النُّشُورِ And it is God who sends the winds and they stir the clouds and we drive them to a dead land and give life thereby to the earth after its lifelessness Thus is the resurrection. Now, there was a similar verse that we covered when we, when we uh, discussed a Surah al rum So I'm not going to go into too much detail. I don't want to be repetitive. Now, this verse is one of the many verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where the manner, the way in which Allah gives life to the dead is employed as a metaphor for qiyamah, for nushur, for resurrection. You know, so so Allah subhanahu wa taala, you know, one of the one one of the proofs that He gives for the possibility of resurrection, especially to those who doubt that this is even possible, is the fact that it's happening before your eyes. You know, it's one thing to say that this is something that will happen in the future, and of course, resurrection in its in its full sense, is, is something, it is, it's a future event. But we have all of these small examples of resurrection happening in the natural world. So, and I've, I've mentioned this, I think, when we discuss Surah Ar-Rum. Now, this verse uses the plural, right? Wallahu الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ riyah. Riyah is the plural of rih. Winds. So you have winds and you have wind. Now, interestingly, the the positive revivifying dimension, you know, revivifying meaning the, the, the winds that give life, the revivifying dimension of winds, which is which is used in the plural. So when wind has a positive connotation, the Quran typically uses the plural, and this occurs 10 times in the Quran, and each time. That, the, that wind is used in the plural, it conveys 
an aspect of divine mercy. You know, the sending down of the rain, the, the pollination of, uh, of, veg of flowers and so on and so forth. This is when the plural is used. Now, when Allah speaks about when, when the singular form is used, rih, it's, used, it's often used to express Allah's ghadab, Allah's wrath. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destroyed certain uh, civilizations of the past through this natural force. And again, Allah's wrath, His punishment, it, it uses the singular. When He speaks about His rahmah and His blessings, wind is in the plural. And this goes, it, this, this returns to one of the most important themes in the Quran, and that is the idea that Allah's mercy supersedes his wrath. That his mercy supersedes his wrath. And in the context, you know, because the, this, this is also something for us to reflect on that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, he's able to revive dead earth through rain. Now, in the previous verse, we were speaking about hearts that are diseased and are corrupted. In the same way that Allah is able to give life to the earth that has died, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also able to give life to a heart that is dead. And in the same way that rain gives life to the earth, the rain of revelation gives life to the heart. So the Quran, so revelation is essentially a spiritual rain that, uh, that descends upon the heart and has the ability to revive it and to, uh, and to bring life into it. The last verse that we'll look at uh, today is verse number 10. مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعِزَّةَ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا Whosoever desires might, you know, Izza is a type of honor that is based on power. Whoever desires might to God belongs might altogether. To him ascend the good word and righteous deed and the righteous deed raises it. As for those who plot evil deeds, theirs shall be a severe punishment and their plotting shall come to ruin. Now there are a number of ahadith about this concept of of Izz, of Izz. There's a, a, a famous uh, narration from Imam al-Sadiq, and I believe Imam Zain al-Abidin has a similar uh, tradition where the Imam alayhi salam says, Man arada izzan bila ashira. He who wishes for honor, for might, without noble lineage, without a powerful tribe. And of course, this is Arabia. It's a very tribal culture. Your identity and your value is heavily dependent on the tribe that you hail from. Imam al-Sadiq says, Man arada izzan bila ashira. Whoever wants honor without any affiliation to a tribe. Waghinan bila mal. Whoever wants wealth without riches, without money. Wahaybatan bila sultan. And whoever wants dignity without necessarily being a ruler what what should you do if you want honor without affiliation to tribe if you want wealth without money if you want dignity without political power if you want these things Remove yourself from the disgrace of God's disobedience to the honor of his obedience. You know, Allah is Al-Aziz. Allah, with Allah is absolute honor. And he only bestows it upon his close servants. 
you're not going to get honor anywhere else except from the source of honor and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen in a tradition he says I'lam أنه لا عز لمن لا يتذلل لله Know that the one who does not abase himself in front of God has no honor. وَلَا رِفْعَةَ لِمَنْ لَا يَتَوَاضَعُ لِلَّهِ And the one who does not humble himself before God has no elevation. You will not be elevated. You know, and this reminds me of, you know, the likes of, of Saddam. And this is something that we witnessed with our own eyes. You know, this is someone who felt that he was the most powerful person in the world, who used to live in the most lavish palaces. And look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliated him. They, they pulled him out of a rat hole and his he looked like he was, you know, he had he looked like a, a dirty rodent. He didn't even look human. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliates those who are arrogant, who try to, to gather, who try to draw their honor from money, from power. If, if your honor comes from these things, it will be taken away and you will be humiliated. There's a beautiful statement from Luqman, Luqman who is mentioned in the Quran, the 31st, the 31st chapter of the Quran is named after him. He says to his son, in dunya, if you want to attract honor in this world, then cut off your greed of drawing advantage from what other people have in their possession. You know, don't, don't have hope. And don't be greedy. Don't have your eyes on the possessions of others. He says, Verily the prophets and the Siddiqun, the truthful ones, achieved what they did. They attained the honor that they attained because they cut off, by cutting off their greed, they had no desire for the material possessions of other people. And this is why when Allah sends these prophets, many of the, especially the elites of the community, they say, what do you want? And they say, we want nothing. Our reward is with Allah. And this, this is what gave them honor in their communities. They didn't want anything. If, if the prophets, if people had an inkling that these messengers are propagating their message and they want material compensation, they would have lost honor. They would not have been respected by their people, by their communities. So Luqman, this is, a, this is very important. And even the Prophet the Prophet never had any desire for the wealth or the power of, of the Arabs. In fact, when 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 the Quraysh pressured Abu Talib to silence his son and, you know, talk to your nephew because he's creating a lot of trouble in Meccan society. Abu Talib, he goes, they, they had some, they made some offers. They made some proposals to the Prophet. And Abu Talib took those proposals to his nephew. And he said to him that, you know, Quraysh wants you to suspend your your campaign, your the, pro, the propagation of your message, your ministry, and they offer you, you know, if you want wealth, they'll make you the wealthiest person. If you want women, they'll marry you to the most beautiful women. If you want power, they'll make you the king of Arabia. Believe me, if the prophet even showed any desire for any of these things, they would have destroyed his reputation. That this guy's a con artist. He just wants money. He wants position. What does the Prophet say? He says, Oh, my uncle, if they, you know, if they put the sun in my, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, 
for me to stop spreading this message. I will not. Until God makes this message prevail or I die in this process. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported the Prophet through Khadija. So the Prophet never needed, he, he, had, he never had his eyes on the wealth or the, the material possessions of others. And the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him in this way. And this is why he was respected by his people. So if you want honor, true honor is only with Allah. Because anything that you think gives you honor, that thing is transient. If your honor comes from wealth, well, wealth is not forever. Eventually you die and you have to depart that wealth. If your sense of honor comes from your job or your career or a political position, that's also temporary. Meaning that once that is finished, your, honors, your honor has been taken. So if your sense of honor is derived from something that is limited and transient and temporary, then, then your honor is also temporary and it's not even real. But if your honor is derived from Al-Aziz, from the one whose honor is absolute and infinite, if you attach yourself to him, then by virtue of being his servant, you are eternally honored. To him ascend the good word and the righteous deed. And the righteous deed raises it, it uplifts it. Now, what is the meaning of the good word and what does it mean for the righteous deed to elevate it? To raise it up. Now, some mufassirin they say that al kalim tayyib is a reference to the expression of a correct belief system. So, some have said al kalim tayyib is to say la ilaha illallah, and the righteous deed refers to the affirmation of the heart, because. You know, the affirmation of the heart is the activity of the heart. And that's a type of deed. It's the, the act, the deed of the heart is the, affirm, the affirming of that, uh, that correct belief. I forgot to put the, uh, the translations here, but I'll, I'll add that inshallah in the slides. I'll share uh, just, uh, I think, two or three narrations from the Ahlul Bayt where they explain the meaning of Al-Kalimu Tayyib and the idea of وَلَعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ عن الصادق عليه السلام Imam al-Sadiq says الكلم الطيب So the good word is general now it, So Imam al-Sadiq is giving us probably the, the most important or the highest instance of this uh, the, the, the best example of this good word الكلم الطيب قول المؤمن the good word is the saying, is the expression of the believer when they say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Aliyun waliullah, Aliyun waliullah, wa khalifatu, wa khalifatu Rasulullah. Imam al Sadiq says the good word is the articulation of a sound belief system, which is to say that there is no God but Allah that Muhammad is, is his messenger and Ali is his wali, his, uh, his successor. And then, so that, so according to Imam al-Sadiq, al-Kalim al-Tayyib is to articulate the proper aqidah. It's related to aqidah. The proper, the correct, the sound belief system. Wal-amal salih the righteous deed, that is that is meant by this verse is al bil qalb. It's to believe it in the heart. It's the affirmation in the heart. And hada huwa al haq min indillahi la shakka fihi min rabbil alim. So al kalim al tayyib is to speak to articulate your correct beliefs, and the righteous deed is 
the affirmation of the heart that this is the truth and there is no doubt in it and this is the truth from the Lord of the worlds. This is a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq. There's a tradition from Imam al-Baqir. وعن الباقر عليه السلام قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله إن لكل قول مصداقا من عمل يصدقه أو يكذب إمام الباقر عليه السلام he says every saying has a litmus test to determine whether that statement is true or false فإذا قال ابن آدم وصدق قوله بعمل رفع قوله بعمله إلى الله. If a person confirms what they say with what they do, meaning that there is authenticity between word and action, Allah elevates that word. So the word only has value when it's when it's when it's authentic, when it's affirmed by our actions. That's when it's it, it's raised up to God. Meaning that's that's that that is when it is accepted. For someone to just say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, but they don't their actions don't reflect the belief in that reality. That doesn't have value. وَإِذَا قَالَ وَخَالَفْ وَخَالَفَ عَمَلُهُ قَوْلًا رَدَّ قَوْلَهُ عَلَىٰ عَمَلِهِ الْخَبِيثِ وَهَوَىٰ بِهِ فِي النَّارِ Now if someone's actions do not correspond with their beliefs, it is rejected, it is not elevated, and it is thrown into the hellfire. So, so far both of these traditions indicate that if we want our beliefs to be accepted by God, that our, our deeds, our actions reveal what we really believe. You know, sometimes we, we think of belief and action as two separate things. In reality, they're related because there's a difference between what we claim to believe and what we actually believe. And your actions are the litmus test that determine the truthfulness of what you say or the, the falsehood of your claim. So if you believe in Allah, if you believe in the messenger, and your actions don't reflect that belief, then it, it doesn't ascend to God. That you're, you're, Even though you might, in the fiqh sense, be considered a Muslim, but that's not authentic. Because your actions, uh, your beliefs are verified through your actions. The righteous deed raises it up. And then finally, in Al-Kafi, we have a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq. وَفِي الْكَافِ عَنِ الصَّادِقَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فِي هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ قَالَ وِلَايَتُنَا أَهْلُ الْبَيْتِ وَأَوْمَأَ بِيَدِهِ إِلَى صَدْرِ فَمَنْ لَمْ يَتَوَلَّنَا لَمْ يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ لَهُ عَمَلًا Imam al-Sadiq, he says, what is meant by the righteous deed, وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحِ يَرْفَعُ So the, the good word is our beliefs. Our belief in God's oneness and akhirah and so on and so forth. And the righteous deed elevates it, raises it up. Imam al-Sadiq, when he mentioned the righteous deed, he said the righteous deed is to believe in our guardianship, the Ahlul Bayt. Because if someone knowingly rejects, if someone rejects the authority of the Ahlul Bayt, the guardianship of Ahlul Bayt, Allah doesn't raise their actions, meaning that their actions are not accepted. They're not maqbool. They are not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With that, brothers and sisters, we'll conclude uh, our session. Actually, there's one, one last part of the, uh, the ayah that I'll cover, and that will be the end. The end of ayah number 10. وَالَّذِينَ يَمْكُرُونَ السَّيَّعَاتِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَكْرُ أُولَٰئِكَ هُوَ يَبُورٌ As for those who plot 
evil deeds. Theirs shall be a severe punishment. Now, as we mentioned, this is the middle of the Meccan period, and there's probably already conversations and plans to eliminate the prophet. And their plotting shall come to ruin. Now, some commentators assert that the evil deeds, as for those who plot evil deeds, this is a reference to the discussions that the kuffar, the mushrikeen, were having about what to do with the prophet. Some of them were suggesting that we should imprison him. Some were saying that we should banish him. We should kill him. This is what Allah is saying. As for those who plot evil deeds, theirs shall be a severe punishment. And their plotting shall come to ruin. What they're planning to do won't happen. They won't achieve success. They won't achieve victory. They won't actualize their evil plan. And of course, we know that the Prophet ﷺ escaped their assassination attempt. Faithul Kashani in his tafsir, tafsir al-Safi, he also says that this verse applies also to those who plotted to usurp the Khilafah from Amir al-Mu'mineen in, in Saqif. And of course, this ayah was revealed prior to that, but the Quran is a living text and it applies to all of these instances. And those who plotted against the Ahlul Bayt, in the end, they will not receive what they want. You know, even if you look at those who usurped the Khilafah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, they lived very short lives. The first lived for two years. The second lived for, he was a Khalifa for 10 years. You're talking about a very short period of time. And their plotting shall come to ruin. Of course, no matter what they do, no matter how much they try to sideline, the Ahlul Bayt, the Nur, the light of Ahlul Bayt will always be kept alive. It will always reach the hearts. And as Sayyid Zainab herself says, She says to Yazid that, you know, uh, you will not, uh, you will not erase, you will not eradicate our remembrance. And you will not kill our inspiration and our our message. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Akhir Da'wana and Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Alihi Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Al-Hajjil Any questions or comments? I only have about five minutes for Q&A so I apologize. I have some things I have to tend to. So any questions or comments? Welcome. Um, could you describe what is the difference between Izza and Haiba, honor and dignity? The difference between honor and uh, Izza. And so as I said, Izza is a type of honor that is, is related to power. Whereas Haiba doesn't necessarily have to be related to power. It could just be related to... Uh, you know, to piety or to, uh, you know, to, to prestige uh, in, a, in a community. But Izza is specific because Izza is related to the word uh, Aziz. So it's, it's a type of honor and dignity that is, that is uh, that's associated with power. Whereas Haiba is, uh, is not, it doesn't necessarily have to be related to uh, any type of power. You know, for example, a scholar who's who doesn't have any power, or he's he's not from a well-known tribe, they, they might have heba. At least from a linguistic perspective, izza is the dignity and the honor that's related to uh, power. It was a little confusing to see that izza has that power connotation because if, if a person has no, like in the hadith that you had shared, like if a person has no tribe, doesn't have any real power. It was surprising to see that power is what you get by believing in Allah because you would attribute all your power or everything to Allah. So that part was a little confusing. You could clarify that. Ahsan. So, um, so could, could you maybe uh, clarify how that, the, that how you could still have any izza if you're, you don't have any physical, is then, then you're attributing everything to Allah. How, how would that work? 
now again when we say power it doesn't mean that uh we're talking about power in the in the worldly sense you know power is a very broad concept and it, re it can refer to someone's someone's endurance someone's resilience someone's impact their ability to perceive uh preserve the truth against all odds so a mu'min is aziz a mu'min has has uh, has dignity and they have the spiritual resilience. So we shouldn't think that power only means uh, uh, power in the the political or the worldly sense. So every mu'min, even as even a mu'min who is physically weak, has you know through their iman they have they enjoy a type of strength. And that's why even if you look at some of the uh, some of those people, uh, the companions who supported the Ahlul Bayt, they love the Ahlul Bayt. You know, if you look at the day of Ashura, you have some of the companions of Imam Hussein that were over 90. So, you know, many of them may not have had great physical strength, but when a person has strong Iman and their soul is so pure, you know, sometimes you, there are even cases where the, the power of the soul takes over the body. That even though even so phys, so physically we, we might not have an explanation as to how a 90 year old is fighting in battle and is able to fight courageously despite their old age despite their thirst and their hunger so you see that the spiritual power sometimes can take over the uh the physical uh, reality of someone so all mu'minin if someone has iman they definitely enjoy some some type of power by virtue of that nearness to Allah. And that power can be expressed physically. It can be expressed through, uh, you know, through other, uh, through other ways like resilience and endurance and patience and so on. Yeah. And uh, do you still have time? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, on, on the very last verse at the ending, where it talks about the people, their evil plotters, or their plotting will come to ruin. Uh, is there plotting coming through? Is it talking about plotting coming coming through in this verse specifically? It's not simply uh, that they'll be ruined in the next world. Is, is this a lesson that you can apply to like any person in today? Is that say whatever they're doing, people are doing today, it will eventually any movement they're starting will eventually be ruined. In, in now again, anyone who plots evil deeds, they will. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has a way of exacting justice against them, at least even partially in this life. Now, and this could be something that they experience on their deathbed, the frustration of their plans, their 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 plans, you know. What they desire, what they had wished, maybe doesn't go according to plan. Now, for sure, absolute justice will be exacted against them uh, in the hereafter. But even in dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that's why Allah says they plan and Allah plans. And even in this life, we know, you know, for, from our belief system that, that in this life, we will witness the victory of, of truth over falsehood. So... So even even in this life, there will be a degree of of justice that will be served. Now, as for every single individual, now Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, has a way of as I mentioned, they might Allah may exact justice against them in certain in certain ways in this life, but is that the case with everybody? Not necessarily. But what they leave behind, so even those who passed away. And they plot, they you know, their evil plots. Eventually, that that planning will fall apart, either in their lifetime or, or after. I'll get a very simple example is Muawiyah. Muawiyah, when he was on his de deathbed, his plot was to, to prevent Imam Hussein salam from becoming Khalifa. So what does he do? He appoints Yazid. This is an evil plot. Muawiyah dies thinking that, you know, I, I succeeded. 
and we don't of course we don't know what his condition was on his deathbed allah you know we we let's just assume that he, he had a peaceful death but up until the last moments he was plotting what happened after his his death the greatest martyrdom in human history which which created a domino effect that caused an empire that he built to be toppled so this is one example of and their plotting shall come to ruin you know sometimes these individuals they they pave the path of their own destruction without even realizing it you know it's similar to pharaoh if you look at the story of pharaoh pharaoh is told that a child will be born from the israelites who will overthrow your empire who will, who will bring about your destruction so what does he do so he plots he issues an order that every new male newborn child is to be executed among the israelites and then what happens you know obviously him, him and him and asia they can't have children he ends up adopting who not just any israelite he adopts the israelite who overthrows him I mean, look at look at the look at how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests his power that the one who is going to think about the destruction of Pharaoh, Pharaoh raises him himself. So when Allah says, and their plotting shall come to ruin, sometimes this happens in the lifetime of a person, sometimes it happens generations later, and some in, in some cases it might not be until the, the dhuhr of the 12th Imam. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. And um, on the hadith that you had mentioned, where fairly the hearts are between the two fingers of the beneficent, um, yeah. could you explain in what sense was that hadith intended? Is it that if I could saying that like Allah has a, it's, it's, a, it's like having his fingers on a chess piece ready to move it uh, to turn whichever way? Yeah, I mean, you know, this this hadith, as I said, is is a metaphor for the the absolute control that Allah has over our hearts. You know, every everything that we do is directly is, is swallowed by the heart. You know, one of the meanings of you know, in Allah has sari al hisab. God is quick in His reckoning. It, one of the meanings of this, according to some scholars, is that whatever we do is downloaded. It is absorbed by the heart, and because of that. Everything that we do, Allah, you know, at every, you know, throughout the day, Allah, sometimes we do something, Allah turns our hearts to Him. We commit a sin, He turns our heart away from Him. So this, this kind of oscillation between God and between shaitan is something that's happening on a constant basis. So this is, and, and, and this is all in Allah's hands. So as I, as I said, that when we when we do good when allah loves what we do he turns our hearts to him when we when he hates what we do he turns our hearts away from us you know and and this is why you can't force people to believe you can't force someone to love another person because it's not in our hands it's not in our hands it's, this is something that we don't have control over we have control over our action but we don't have control over the result, the impact of those actions. You know, I can steal. I have, I have, I have the free will to choose to steal or to refrain from it. But once I choose to steal, once I choose to inflict harm, I don't have any control over the impact that has on my heart. I can choose to pray. And if I pray with, with sincerity and with humility, I can choose to do that, but I don't have a choice of what that does to my heart. When I do that, my heart is drawn to Allah. I can't. So if the worst thing that you can do to me is to deprive me of, of God. So we have control of our actions, but we don't have control over 
the impact our actions have on our hearts. And this is what Allah means that, that our hearts are between his, his two fingers because he controls the impact that it has on our hearts. Does that make sense? Hey, thank you very much. Ahsantum, I hope you found that uh, to be beneficial, inshallah. Uh, by the way, so I, I think next Wednesday we can still have our session and then we'll, we'll take a, a break uh, for at least the first you know, 12, 13 nights of Muharram and then we'll resume inshallah. Does that work for you guys? Uh, yes, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. So we'll meet inshallah next uh, Wednesday and then uh, we'll uh, we'll discuss when our next uh, session will be. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much. I have to sign off, uh, but uh, I'll see you guys next week. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah.